What's up guys, welcome to River Park. Thanks for joining our online experience today. You're watching our most recent live experience. If you wanna catch us the next time we're live, we're live every single Sunday at 9 a.m. You can join us here online or you can check it, our experience out at one of our campuses. We wanna to get to know you. So if you're not yet connected, you can either click the Get Connected link or text the word River Park to 97 Zero, zero, zero. We hope this experience blesses you today and hope to see you soon. on Jesus this morning.
Again, we are so pumped that you are joining with us today. If you're a guest, hey, thank you so much for being here. We simply want to know who you are. So all we ask is that you text the word River Park to 97000. Or if you're watching online, you can click the link that's in the comments. To all of you who are already connected to River Park, we're about to move into a time of giving. This morning, due to COVID-19, we are only going to participate in giving digitally. So we have three ways that you can give. First, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321. You can also give on our app or you can give on our website at riverpark.net. I'm about to pray for you. And when I'm done, we're going to give you about 30 seconds to give from wherever you are. Let's pray together as we prepare to give. God, we come to you and we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for all that you are doing in our presence, Lord. And we ask that as we give, that your name will be made much of right here in Shreveport, Bossier, and all around the world because of the faithfulness of your people to give. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Thank you again for this opportunity to give today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Arrangements for you 
There'll be a bucket at the back, and if you need an envelope, put something in. We'll facilitate you on that. Thank you for being here today. Wow. Wow. To our online group today that watched from North Carolina to uh, Timbuktu, uh, thank you for coming along, and thank you for being patient with us as we modify our presentations. We've been with you for a long time now, and uh, I know this is a little bit of adjustment. It's not as quite, quite as uh, fantastic, perhaps, as far as production, but we want to continue to make that available. So I wish you could see what's here on campus today at the Park Campus. It's so exciting, but we want you to be patient when you're comfortable to come back out. And to those of you that are watching overseas, thank you for connecting with us today. To our home crowd here today at the park and to our Benton campus that is also collective here with us today, we welcome you back. And as Pastor Jeremy has already said, we want you to feel comfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, don't come. If you feel comfortable, keep coming. We want you to participate. I do want to say this, that I think it's important that either way, you not walk in fear, but you choose to walk in faith. Amen. Amen. So thank you for getting out on this uh, early morning. It's raining outside. For those of you that are watching online, uh, it is raining here on the campus, but it didn't stop this group from coming out today, and we're so excited about what God is doing. We, we launched this new series called Fresh, and I'm about to get into it. There's something I need to clarify. First of all, I want to thank Pastor Jeremy and Jill for being part of our campus here at River Park now. And someone asked me during the break after we met with the volunteers, they said, where are you going? And I said, I don't think I'm going anywhere. I'm staying right here. Pastor Jeremy is going to pastor this campus just like Pastor Trey pastors the Benton campus. And so he will facilitate, administrate, and take care of a lot of details that, that a lot of times Pastor Marcus and I get bogged down in. So we can focus on leading the charge relative to ministry and being a voice for this house. And so I want you to know we ain't going anywhere now. And my wife wants to stay, so if she can stay, if y'all will approve that, we'll let her stay as well. So I love you. I want to hug each and every one of you, and, and probably if you, some, some of you would let me, I would, in fact, do that. Uh, so thank you for being here. Revelation chapter 21. Uh, if you want to grab a Bible, I'll give you a minute. To those of you that are watching online, uh, we concentrate this to you. So grab your Bible. And I'm going to ask you something. This is, this is including not only the people here today, but those on our online campus, that there will be moments in this today, especially at the end. I, I know that in all cases, even here today, it's easy because we're out of our norm to be distracted by something or someone. I want you to respect what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to shut everything else out, including what's next. And we have a lot of volunteers here today that are serving. I want you to forget about what's next, and I want you to be in the moment. Say that with me, online and here. Be in the moment. Say it again. Be in the moment. So now that you have those instructions, let's go to Revelation chapter 21. This is the apocalyptic writings. It just sounds cool to say that, and that's why I said it. Um, <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm that educated. It just means I've practiced to say that word. Uh, <clears throat> but revelation is the end, and we often say as Christians, if you want to know how things turn out, go to the end of the book. And quite frankly for you, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good deal. And so this is that new kingdom, that new heaven, that new earth, Heaven is happening, and guess who's in charge? Jesus is. In fact, we see here in Revelation, we see him as he is. In fact, the Bible says we will be like him for we see him as he is. One thing and only one thing allows you to see Jesus as he is, and that is, or allows you to be like him, and that is seeing him as he is. Paul said it this way, we now see through a glass darkly. In other words, we don't see complete. It's like walking in and someone say, into a room and someone says, check this out, and you realize you can't see what they are telling you is happening, and you realize all of a sudden that you've got your sunglasses on. 
And those Oakleys can get you in trouble because you're not seeing things clearly. We, our vision has been somewhat diminished and skewed, if you will, by the world that we live in. We can't see all of Jesus. The truth is, you can't handle all of Jesus. But when we get in this day that I'm about to propose to you uh, in Revelation, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Amen? That's going to be wonderful. That's going to be exciting. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away or wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain or COVID-19. I'm sorry, it wasn't in there, but I added it. I think that's okay. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Can I, can I paraphrase here? I am making everything fresh. It's fresh. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Now, the book of Revelation, a lot of people call it Revelations, and that is improper uh, theologically. Uh, it, is, it is truly, if you look at the real meaning of this book of the Bible and the canon of scriptures, it is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. So imagine, I don't want to dilute the power of Christ in this way, but imagine an onion or a banana that's being peeled and open up and you see the layers of it. That's what this is. Even though we get caught up in the eschatology of it and the signs and the wonders and all the beasts and all the weird things, here it is in simple. It is referring to what was, what is, and what is to come. You can break it down into three parts. Come to think of it, this is fitting when you consider the authentic name of the revelation of Jesus Christ because he demonstrates the eternal one, what was, what is, and what is to come. After all, if there is no beginning and no end, it's clear what was, what is, and what is to come. That's why you need not fear today. Because you are in acquaintance with and have a connection with the one who was, who is, and who is to come. In fact, the scripture calls him the Alpha and the Omega. That means in the, in the Greek alphabet, everything from A to Z. So if you, are, if you are connected to the one that is Alpha to Omega, everything from A to Z, he's not surprised by anything. Two and a half of three months ago, he was not surprised when someone said COVID-19 and humans shook in their boots. He wasn't surprised. He was not afraid. In fact, he says, run to me. In fact, he says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, those of you who labor, and I will give you rest. Some of you today that are watching, some of you that are here today listening and, and perusing the power and the presence of God have discovered that he can give you rest. And you have discovered a peace in the middle of one of the darkest storms that has ever hit planet Earth. It truly is. A peace that passes understanding. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 deal with seven churches. Now, I don't want to get into the deep thoughts here, but they are churches like Sardis and churches like Philadelphia and churches like Smyrna and Pergamos. And, and, and then there's the last one. The seventh church is called Laodicea that they make God so sick or Jesus so sick that he says, I will spew you. You make me want to vomit. Has anybody ever said that about you? Well, this church had that said about them. In fact, five of the seven churches that, that Jesus reviews here gets a rebuke, but two do not. The first one is Smyrna. It's the second church that's mentioned in chapter 2 and 3 here of the seven representative churches of Asia. And this church in Revelation 2 and 3 is called Smyrna. It's in a very wealthy area, and yet the church is poverty-stricken. Not only are they poverty-stricken, they're very much persecuted. 
They're going through some things, much like COVID-19. They are suffering. And Jesus says to them, not a rebuke, one of two that he does not rebuke. He says, you're doing good. Even though you're poverty, poverty stricken and you're going to go through some persecution, you need to take heart. You're going to come out in the end. They are afflicted. Say, they are afflicted. You've been afflicted. You know what affliction feels like. The economy's been afflicted. Our physical health has been afflicted. Our mental health has been afflicted. Probably right now, the greater concern is not over the virus itself. It's, again, it's, a, it's concern with the isolation. It was like the great theologian said, we all need somebody to lean on. And I say that with much respect because he passed away during COVID-19. We all need somebody to lean on. And the truth is we know who that somebody is. So Smyrna said, Jesus says to Smyrna, you're doing good even though you're afflicted. Go to the sixth church of Asia. It's called Philadelphia. And guess what? You know what Philadelphia is, the city of brotherly love. It's a city of affection. And he says, you have affection that's incredulous. So what if the church, the universal church as we know it, the body of Christ, move with uninhibited motion toward the goal from affliction to affection. What if somewhere, because that's where the church should live. A perfect example of that is a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Joseph. Joseph was his father's favorite son. He is used of God and he has these dreams from God of how God is going to use him. And in this journey, the first thing he's introduced to on his dream journey is a pit. Now, that's amazing how that happens. God gives us these big dreams, and we get real arrogant. We get real pumped up like God's going to do something fantastic, and the first thing we find is the wall of a pit. And then it's like someone said, if, if life is a bowl of cherries, then why am I in the pits? And that's where Joseph was, was in the pits. And some of you have been in the pits. But there's hope because this caravan of Midianites or Ishmaelites, synonymous, comes along, buys him from from his owners and and take him as a slave. He ends up in Potiphar's house. He ends up back in prison. So it's like squeeze and release. Squeeze from Smyrna to Philadelphia. It ends up, if you fast forward to the story of Joseph the dreamer, you'll find out that he's introduced to his brothers that he hasn't seen in years. And his first job to do as a dreamer really called by God is not to accomplish something great or at least as far as man is concerned but to accomplish the greatest thing he could ever do and that's forgive the people that persecuted him and he does that he forgives them he, he, in fact it's such a weeping emotional moment some like, somewhat like today that he has to turn away and go backstage and dry his tears because it's such a moment He goes from affliction to affection, from Smyrna to Philadelphia. And I want you to just put that in your mind today as we journey through this re-entry program, as we try to become fresh and, and connected to and vital to the world that we live in. So what if the New Testament church went straight from affection or affliction to affection? The universal church, and you might want to write this down, The universal church functions at its best under supreme affliction or saturated in supernatural affection. And that's why we preach and teach here at River Park that we need to love God, love people, and in doing so, we can, and matter of fact, will make a difference. Amen. I think we can do that, in fact, and make the switch from affliction to affection. But I don't think you can do it just by picking yourself up by your bootstraps. I don't think you can do, as they say, by grinning and bearing it. I don't think, in fact, I don't think it's an intestinal fortitude at all. I don't think it's grit at all. I think it requires supernatural power. It seems there was an old Kentucky mule that was invited to a race And he lost. He didn't only lose, he came in last. In fact, he was so duressed by what had happened, he went back home to his farm and he trained harder. He ate nutritious alfalfa and switched from whole oats to crimped oats. 
He exercised regularly, and a few months later, another invite came and an invitation to take place in one of the largest races in the world. He couldn't have been better prepared. And so when the gunshot rang on the morning of the race, he couldn't believe himself. He couldn't believe how fast he came out of the gate and how much he could feel his muscles as they rippled under his gray skin. He knew he had it. He felt so good. He could imagine in his mind already the wreath of roses around his neck as the winner in the winner's circle. But you know, his pride quickly vanished as he fell to the back of the pack. And soon enough, he stopped and just sat down on the track. And he realized two things as he sat there on the track. He was at the halfway point while the others were on the final stretch. And the biggest realization was the fact that he was the only mule in a race made for horses. He was a mule in a horse race. Although this is a human race that we are in, we are not born to run in this race set before us without some outside help. Let me say it this way. We are not born, you were not born to run in this race without some upside help. Amen. So to participate in this race set before us, we are pre-qualified even to even enter the race by someone else. You can't get good enough to get God, but you can get enough of God to get good. And when you realize that, like David, you can say, I will lift my eyes to the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the author says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Jesus is your pre-qualifier. I know that's so simple, it sounds simplistic, but it is not. This is a truth that we have to not only get in our cranium, we have to get it in our heart. We have to know it deep to our core, and as the Word of God gets even into the bone marrow, we have to believe this. Not just a glance at Jesus, but keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Look, when God gives you faith, he doesn't give you perfect faith. He doesn't give you perfect faith. If he did, you'd walk off without him. He is the honer. He is the perfecter. He is the trimmer. He is the initiator of our faith. Because, and here's why, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. All of this is incredibly true, but keeping your eyes on Jesus means more than a glance his way. It means staying focused on him. We often say people who uh, say to us, uh, we think, or they think they have a bad, they have an idea. They say, well, I have an idea. And we say something like this, think again, buddy. Because we know how stupid and sometimes superfluous that idea might be. We say, think again. Well, John says this to, or Jesus says this to a, a man called Nicodemus that comes to Jesus by night in the narrative of John 3. And in the Gospel of John, when Nicodemus comes to him, Nicodemus starts bragging on his teaching ability. He's attracted. In fact, he calls him rabbi. But Jesus answers a question that Nicodemus is not asking. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, John 3, 3. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? I mean, this guy's really a thinker. And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. Humans can produce or reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. 
Twice Nicodemus asked the same question. Remember, he approached Jesus by night and he is, has respect for his teaching and respect for, uh, for his information, but he has no respect that we know of for his deity. He has not recognized him as the son of God. So he is the antithesis of what the Hebrew writer says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In our vernacular, what that means is look unto Jesus, who is the one that can give you freshness in everything you do. He can, he can cause everything to become new. He doesn't even have to work with what you have. Because he's not building his life on your life. He's building his life in you on his life in you. That'll preach. So the race for life cannot be won with analytical reasoning, but with full and complete regeneration. You must be born again. You got to stop your stinking thinking and you got to get it from your head into your heart that Jesus is not only something I'm glancing at, he's something I'm looking to. So here's the thing, and I don't want to shock you with my terminology, but you cannot win a horse's race in a mule's body. Your father has to be much more to you than a jackass. It's a Bible word. It's, uh... And that's the problem. We try to lean on, we try to lean on these. Oh, let me just give you a little, little, little biology here. In order to create a mule, a jack and a horse have to connect some way. There has to be a donkey and a horse connect. And a mule can't reproduce. So why would you want to win a race? Because nobody is this. I mean, mules are made to be mules, not to be running. Sometimes we take these bodies that God has redeemed and we try, to, we try to do something that's unnatural with them, even though the world is saying this is natural. But the most natural thing you can do is attach yourself to your heavenly Father and say, God, I don't know what you have for me, but I trust you completely. You are not a hybrid. You can reproduce. You can be part of the sons and daughters of, of God and proliferate in this kingdom. And how do you do that? Go into all the world, baptizing and teaching and making disciples. That's the way you do it. I know some of you hadn't got over the... And I don't care. Verse 16, COVID-19 hashtag. For, the, <laughs> for this is how God loved the world. Verse 16. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on the fact God's light came into the world but people love the darkness more than light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. And that's the whole idea of spiritual proliferation is others seeing you as you get closer to the light of God. That's what the church does. We are fresh to this world. We're something unique and we're something different. They don't need more of the same. They don't need more entertainment. We've got great entertainment in our world. But what we do need is something fresh, something tangible, and something real. Nicodemus is a mule in a horse's world. He's trying to see God's plan, and yet Jesus is saying, you can't see it unless you have new birth, unless you're born again. Now, wouldn't you like to know that everything you did is what God wants? And that's what Jesus is saying here. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. And the only way that can happen is for you to start over, to start fresh, to be born again. In Galatians 5, 19, I don't want to go there, but I just want to reference this just for a minute, is that it, in reference, it talks about the works of the flesh. 
And then it says the contrast of that. And when you get time, please do this. To those of you that are watching, please take your Bible today or tomorrow sometimes and look at this again. It's works of the flesh. And can somebody say to me what it is relative to the Spirit? Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. So it's works are fruit. We have a pear tree in our backyard at the farm. And a couple of years ago, or last year, I pruned it. And it was a beautiful tree, and yet it was hard for me to take time to cut a lot of those limbs off. But my wife can verify this. It has more pears on it this year than ever before. And in August, it ain't no work. You just stand out there and they'll fall on you. The work happened getting it ready. Jesus has already done the work. What you have to prepare for is the fruit. And, and so why would I concentrate on the works of the flesh when I can have the contrast of that, the fruit of the Spirit? I mean, which one sounds the easiest, work or fruit? The one you were born to do as, is a natural outcropping of the new you. And it's to bear fruit, which is patience, long-suffering, temperance, meekness. Read it in Ephesians 5 when you get time. So a natural outcropping of the new you, the fruit, is fresh. It's fresh. Wouldn't you like your life to be that way? Starting with new birth, starting with something that's different, starting with something that's fresh? When you get time, I want you to do something. I don't have time to delineate today. But I want you to look at two passages of Scripture. One is in Acts chapter 10, and the other is in Acts chapter 19. And I want to give you this image. If I said to you, show me what prayer looks like, what what believing looks like. Show me an icon. If I said, show me an icon of thinking, you'd go. If I said, show me an icon of prayer, you'd go. Praying hands, right? That's believing. That's the icon of believing. It's praying hands. But if I said, show me the icon of receiving, you'd go. And I want you to go in this era that we're in from being a believer to a receiver. I want you to think I'm believing not just so I can say I'm a believer, but I want to prove and demonstrate as I go toward the light that I'm also a receiver. And in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen. And the Lord speaks to Simon Peter and says, I want you to go to Carnelius' house. Gives him this weird vision. He drops this blanket down in front of him. It's like pigs and catfish and all kind of things that the Old Testament Levitical law said you're not supposed to eat. Jewish tradition said you're not, and law said you don't touch that stuff. It's common and unclean. And God keeps putting it in front of, in front of Simon Peter. And Peter keeps seeing it as like, This is breaking the law. This is against my Jewish tradition. And God says, get your eyes off of your tradition and get it on where I'm trying to lead you. I'm trying to send you into another group of people that's never heard and felt the joy of my name and the power of the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. They haven't been revealed. They haven't seen it. So he finally is obedient and he sees what God's trying. So he takes his Jewish entourage, according to the Bible, and they go into Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. And Peter's up there preaching away like I am. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit blesses them and falls on them. And they become receivers. Fast forward to chapter 19. There's another group of people that they are sent to. And and they come in and say, hey, look, where, where are you guys from? What have you done? What's your relationship with the Lord? They say, well, we're of John's baptism. We just thought when John got lost his head, that it was all over. They said, oh no, there's so much more now. Well, we just thought when Jesus died on the cross, it was all done. They said, no, he has sent the comforter. And I'm paraphrasing. He has sent the comforter. So we want you to go from believers in John's baptism to receivers. And that's what this whole thing is about. And I know there's a lot of discussion in today's culture about, and I'm going to tell you why I can pre-qualify that. Is because Christians have a tendency to go from godly to goofy just like that. And so then it automatically makes we sincere, innocent people put up guards. But let me tell you this. You should never be afraid of any gift that the Father is trying to give out. 
You should never be afraid of that. So I want you to convert from just being a believer to being a receiver. What does that look like to you? I don't know. The beautiful thing about River Park, our online campus, as well as our physical campuses, is that we represent such a diversity of people. We have people from Catholic backgrounds, from Baptist backgrounds, from Pentecostal backgrounds, from Methodist backgrounds, from Episcopalian backgrounds. From Heinz 57. And some of you just plain downright heathens. And God loves you. And the beautiful thing is, God wants us to walk toward the light, to be born again, so we can see. I want to see, I want to see all He has to see. Because I'm going to tell you, this world is too dark for you to walk without His light. This world is too dark for you to walk without His light. And I want you to think about that for a minute. And I want you to think about what it looks like for you. What does that look like? You say, well, you know what? I've, I've already received all that he has. Oh, have you? How do you know that? The Bible says relative to the stuff that he's prepared, that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It hasn't even entered into the heart. So in your wildest, most vivid imagination, there's no way. You have experienced all he has. So as long as you're walking toward the light and you stay within the confines of this book called the Bible, you will not err. Because the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the Greek word paraclete, the one alongside, will lead and guide you into all the truth. I want to pray for you. I don't know where you are on your journey, but I'm going to ask you to close everything out right now. To the people that are watching me here, I may not can physically see you, but in my heart I see you. I see your pain. But more than that, I know my Father sees you well. The blood of Jesus extends to you. His healing stripes extend to you. Whether you need emotional healing, you need some mental healing, or physical healing, He's here to minister to you, both in this audience and this audience. And I want you to bow your head wherever you are, And I want you to put your hands in a receiving position. You've been believing long enough. Now receive. Father, I pray for your people right now that you give them an anointing, that you give them blessing, that you give them sustenance as we are doers of your word and not just hearers only, but we receive what you give to us. And I pray in Jesus' name right now.